In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to open today with a reading from Romans chapter 11. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, um, I am Pastor Broer Erickson here in Farmington, New Mexico, which is uh, where the Four Corners meet, uh, the border of Colorado, Arizona, and uh, Utah. That's uh, and New Mexico, obviously. Um, been pastor here at Zion Lutheran Church for uh, the last six years. And uh, I have been invited by uh, Luther Study Days in Bergen, uh, by Jarla Blindheim, uh, to speak about uh, on the freedom of a Christian, or the freedom of a Christian, in the works of Bo Geertz, and, uh, or Yerch, as uh, it's actually supposed to be pronounced, but us Americans, we just butcher names for the fun of it. Um, and, uh, I really decided, uh, with that in mind that I was going to, uh, make a video that would plug my latest translation of Bo Geertz, which is Faith Alone, uh, a novel that he wrote in 1943, or at least published in 1943. Um, but I think a little bit first off, uh, Maybe we need to talk about who Bo Yerch was. Uh, he was a bishop in Gothenburg, uh, but before that, he was a pastor for 11 and a half years in uh, Torpa, which is in Östergötland, um, or East Gothland uh, of Sweden, which is where uh, his two most famous novels uh, take place. Uh, the Hammer of God in English, Sten Grunden in, in Swedish, and Faith Alone, uh, which I have just translated. Uh, briefly, he had been a, grew up in an atheistic family, was an atheist for most of his young uh, life, converted, uh, became a Christian uh, while he was in Uppsala, uh, studying to become a doctor, and then switched gears, uh, ended up becoming a pastor in, in the Church of Sweden there. Uh, and then he was a, a bishop up until the 1969, he, uh, in Gothenburg, Sweden. And then he, uh, wrote some stuff before and afterwards. And the reason uh, I've been invited to, to talk about uh, these things is really because I've translated a good number of his books and uh, people think that I know something about his uh, theology because of that. On the Freedom of a Christian was a work that Luther wrote in 1521 published in 1521 and uh, it's very it's very good for this for this topic uh, of what uh, how it plays out in, in Bo uh books theology most especially in faith alone uh, because uh, it really framed, uh, his book called Faith Alone, uh, which is just a wonderful novel. Uh, but a little bit about that. In 1938, Bo Geertz became the pastor in a small parish, Torpa, on the border with Smoland, uh, Ustergildland, uh, however you want to say it, 
Um, and he was married at the time to his first wife, uh, Ingrid, who he affectionately called Nini. Uh, they had four children together. In 1941, he translated uh, this book, The Hammer of God. Now, this one is really what made Bogirts famous. Uh, it was, when it came out, it was translated almost instantaneously uh, throughout uh, Europe. It uh, received early on a, a translation into English. For the longest time, this was about the only book that you could find by Bogirts in English. Uh, when I was a young man studying or thinking about becoming a pastor, my parents uh, met me in, in Rome. Uh, I was in the Air Force at the time, and my dad handed me this book. It was an earlier copy of it that didn't have the, the last chapter in it, actually. Um, this early on, the 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 early translation was actually translated from a, an East German translation. Uh, it wasn't translated from the original Swedish, as far as, as uh, I can tell. Um, but uh, I read it, I think, like pretty much overnight. I just stayed up and, and read the whole thing. Maybe it took me another night to finish it, but uh, it, it was, it's a really gripping story. And it convinced me to become a pastor. Um, any doubts that I had beforehand were, were gone completely after that. So, but then I, I went around and I, I looked for, for more books to read and I didn't have any. There, there were no, there was nothing. So uh, when I got to seminary, I learned how to speak Swedish and read Swedish anyway. Um, and uh, started translating. 1941, he writes this book. What happens after that is in 1942, Ingrid gives birth to Martin, who actually still lives in Torpa, from what I understand, at the parsonage there. And uh, she, uh, because of complications with the, the birth, uh, a few days later she has basically an aneurysm and she dies. Uh, and that was, uh, as you can imagine, quite a tragic uh, event in the life of, of this man, Bo Geertz. Uh, this is a, a biography, kind of a biography, autobiography, a lot of interviews with him in here um, of his life, the atheist that became bishop. And he relates in here in regards to uh, the death of his wife, Ingrid, that when he went to visit her shortly after Martin had been born, uh, she had with her her favorite books, and one of them was On the Freedom of a Christian uh, by Luther. The way Bo Geertz says this, I'm led to believe that uh, it was also one of his favorite books uh, by Luther. And uh, it becomes apparent as, as we read uh, Faith Alone that uh, he, he used it. Uh, it. It was one of the, the books that he used to really frame the narrative uh, that we find in Faith Alone. That happened in 1942. Faith Alone was then published in 1943. So you get the impression that um, during the Depression that obviously follows uh, the death of a loved one like that, um, Bo Geertz just poured himself into his work uh, as a way of, of combating his own depression. 
And I'll have to say, if the hammer of God is what made Bo Geertz famous and, and has, has kept his, his reputation uh, in Lutheran churches and, and far beyond that uh, around the, uh, the world uh, up until now, I think his writing was better in Faith Alone. Uh, I find the narrative to be much more gripping. I find the characters to be perhaps a little bit more believable. Um, the uh, it, it, And you could tell that he, he's putting uh, some of his own depression, uh, his own um, dark night of the soul, into uh, the characters here in this book. So... On, Christian, uh, on the freedom of a Christian uh, was, uh, was really a favorite book of both Bo Geertz and Ingrid, uh, his wife who had just passed. And uh, it becomes the, the book that, that really helps him write this Reformation narrative. Uh, so we need to maybe look a little bit at, at a couple things here. The thesis that Luther puts forward in On the Freedom of a Christian is a Christian is, perfectly, is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none, and a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Uh Seems contradictory. Uh, we Lutherans like to talk about uh, paradox, and that's really what it is, is a, is a paradox. Um, not, not the shotgun rifle combination that they used on safaris in Africa, but uh, the, the, the philosophical concept of, of a paradox, a, a seemingly contradictory statement that has a resolution. And further on in the freedom of a Christian. He writes, This is that Christian liberty, our faith, which does not induce us to live in idleness or wickedness, but makes the law and the works unnecessary for any man's righteousness and salvation. So these are, are some of the themes that are worked through in faith alone. Now, faith alone is really uh, a prequel to the hammer of God. It's a prequel in that it takes place in the same parish area. Um, and uh, at an earlier time. Faith alone takes place during the Reformation. And Specifically, it takes place between 1541 1543. During uh, a rebellion, the largest uh, peasant revolt in, in the history of Scandinavia is called the Dac Rebellion. And the Dac Rebellion was really concentrated in Smoland, which was to the south of, of Ustergutland. But it broke into uh, the borderlands of, of Udra and uh, Kinda and Schust. In these areas, uh, the, the peasants joined with Dak and they uh, rebelled against the king's reforms. Uh, many of the, the rebellions at this time were about, uh, well, higher taxes. Uh, the king was trying to establish Sweden as a nation. Uh, he needed to pay for uh, a military force. He needed to pay off the, the Lubeckers who he had uh, borrowed excessively from in order to win independence from King Christian of Denmark. And uh, along with that, he had started to, the king had started to, uh, endorse the Lutheran Reformation. He had, for instance, uh, appointed uh, Olaus Petri to uh, the Storschirchen in uh, Stockholm, uh, 
uh, who and Olawas Petri was a, uh, a student of Luther's from Wittenberg, who was a, a uh, Lutheran preacher. Um, the the Lutheran doctrine started to to come down, and it started to uh, influence the king's decisions about how he was going to pay uh, for. Uh, his nation, how he was going to pay off the Lubeckers and so on. And what he did is he started to confiscate some treasures from the church, uh, things that were used in uh, the Catholic mass, um, especially like monstrances. But he also took bells and, and uh, whatever he could really sell and make money off of so he could do this. And with that, uh, the peasants were really not happy because now their churches were starting to look barren. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the lines was that uh, it's going to be so nice as to walk in an empty forest to go to church. Um, <laughs> and they, they, don't, uh, they don't really appreciate these, these reforms. So Daka, who has his own uh, reasons, he starts killing uh, the sheriffs, uh, the bailiffs, the king's men who who collect the taxes and keep the peace in in the provinces, um, starts this rebellion in Smolin, and it comes up. The story then takes place during this rebellion, and it centers around, there's two main characters and a third character that's sort of important to the story. Uh, and they, they all get introduced early on, but there's there's Anders and there's Martin. They, these two brothers who had been sent to school to become priests. Early on in life, uh, they were like 10, 11 when they went to school uh, in Linshirpen. So they go there, study in, in a, a Latin school to become priests. But what happens is where Anders actually comes to love the faith and wants to become a priest and has no greater joy than to be a priest in, in the Catholic Church. Martin reads some of uh, Luther's works and runs off to Stockholm where he gets under the influence of Alois Petri. So uh, the, the brothers part ways. I, I kind of, I, I, I find it sort of funny in that uh, Martin, who is obviously somewhat of reference to Martin Luther himself, uh, narratively, uh, he kind of has the, the opposite uh, history as Luther. I mean, Luther is going to school to become a lawyer and then decides to become a monk against his parents' wishes. But Martin, in this book, uh, is sent to become a... Uh, a priest, according to his mother's wishes, and uh, then rebels and becomes a, a scrivener for the king. Eventually, that's what happens. Um, the third character uh, that comes into it is actually a Lutheran pastor who gets uh, to a neighboring town um, called V in the book. He pastors there. And he becomes sort of a guide for Martin because Martin loses his way. He goes off to Stockholm. He's a country bumpkin in the big city sort of thing. Um, he starts uh, he starts drinking too much. He uh, becomes a little bit of a womanizer. Um, and uh, he, he just loses his way uh, until uh, a friend of his... Um, Court, is his name, uh, gets caught up with some uh, shawarmerai, some, uh, I call them fanatics, uh, sort of early Pentecostal sort of people, uh, led by the Spirit. And um, he gets a hold of Martin, starts giving him a lot of law, and this becomes a catalyst in Martin's life. Try not to give too much of a spoiler alert here. What happens is the two brothers that are separated then, who find themselves on on uh, opposite sides of the battlefield, um, 
at Skrukabi, which is a uh, the major battle in the Dak Rebellion. What happened there is is Dak has to, if he wants to his rebellion to be um, successful, he needs to break through Ustergart Gutland and uh, get up to the next province, and I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but it's another wooded area like Smoland. And there, you know, he could go all the way to Stockholm and take the rebellion straight to the capital. But he's got to get through Ustergutland or Eastern Gothland. I'll just try to say Eastern Gothland from now on. He's got to get through there in order to really have a successful rebellion. And the problem is, is Eastern Gothland is, is farmland. It's plains. It's open. And you got the, the, you got the mercenaries from Germany, the, the Landsnecks. They're very good at fighting on open ground. They use uh, arquebuses, uh, primitive rifles, uh, formations, and they, uh, they're very good in the open ground. And really, you have something that's similar to the American Revolution, in which, you know, the, the Americans were very good at fighting in the woodlands, but if they really wanted to win the revolution, they needed to be able to take, they, they needed to take the king's men in the open field. Um, that was the only way that they were going to get the cities that they needed to conquer and so on, which is why we needed the French help. Um, well... Dak doesn't get any support. The emperor, Charles V, kind of flirts with him a little bit and says he'll give him some support, but he never does, never materializes. And Dak cannot then, um, you know, push this forward. So they come to Skrukaby. This is the major battle in Eastern Gothland. They're going to either push through or they're going to lose. Uh, they lose that battle. Uh, and the rebellion then goes back into Smoland. But uh, that battle, the brothers miss each other on the battlefield. Uh, and they miss each other um, in a very dramatic way that I'll try not to, to destroy for you. But that's a catalyst for Martin in that uh, Martin... Uh, then goes and joins the Schwarmerei. He becomes one of uh, Court's uh, guys. He's trying to uh, make amends for his life by means of the law. And uh, it becomes a catalyst for, for Anders, the brother, the priest, because he ends up uh, losing the right to be a priest at that battle. He, uh, he kills a man. Um, kills several men in the battle. Uh, before he really, he just gets caught up in the battle. Um, and so he becomes a highwayman. Uh, <laughs> goes out into the woods and, uh, you know, lives off the land and uh, starts to get involved in, in uh, sort of guerrilla warfare. Um, and uh, this is the story. Through it all, I won't tell you what happens, but the brothers do get reunited uh, finally. They, they, they become united in the faith. But there are some very great conversations that then happen uh, between uh, Peter, who is the, the pastor in V, uh, and Anders, and Peter and, and Martin. He becomes sort of a go-between for the two brothers. Uh, one of the things that that is treated in this book then is not only on the freedom of a Christian, but in all of Bo Geertz's novels, there was uh, a a push for liturgical renewal. That was one of the things that that was really big with with uh, Bo Geertz was liturgical renewal and, and and bringing an appreciation for the historic liturgy of the church. To the people, and so we have this one here that kind of treats both subjects. Uh, Peter has gone to Anders; he's trying to uh, find refuge for his wife. And uh, in the meantime, 
Anders and, and Peter, uh, they celebrate matins together. So it came that for the first time in many months, Herr Andreas could sing matins and lauds alternately and correctly in his church. The bitterness and the unease left him. Once again, he heard the tranquil echo from the world above, where no complaint or alarm of war would ever be heard again. When they came back out into the sunlight, he said, When was the last time you sang matins? On Sunday, Herr Peter answered. The rector could not hide his surprise. You pray the hours, even though you are a Lutheran? Why not? I learned it in Uppsala from Bishop Lars. In Latin? We sang the hymns in Swedish. The antiphons and responses were in Latin for the most part, but the archbishop would like to put them in Swedish too. Do you pray the whole divine office? Not all of it. I have other things to do in V. On weekdays, it is at best a few of the smaller hours. I pray most of them on holy days, except for the idolaters' prayers to Mary, you understand. That is cheating, all or nothing. I have all, all that benefits salvation. For you, the hours are good works that you do for God. So you need to stack them up so desperately much, and it is never sufficient. For me, the hours and all other prayers are a beggar's path to a gracious God. It is sufficient if I come forward for grace. Then I have the complete fullness of God in faith. Obviously, this conversation doesn't convince uh, Herr Andreas or Anders, uh, Martin's brother, but you see here uh, the the difference in the approach to worship. Uh, that uh, for for the one, it's a work that we're we're constantly trying to do, uh, and for for the Lutheran, for Herr Peter, it's uh, it's not our work so much as it's God's work for us, in which we receive His grace, uh, that grace that brings the freedom for a Christian uh, to perhaps not be as serious about uh, making it through all of the different hours and, and whatnot. Um, some days you you pray and you cut your prayer short because you have uh, people in your life that you have to attend to and see to it that uh, they get what they need. The, uh, the conversation goes on there. Uh, to uh, to talk about marriage. And uh, you get, this is what I mean. As long as I lived the celibate life, I ruled over myself. Then it was no great skill to pretend to be sanctified. If my temper was poor, I just went home to the parsonage. I slept as long as I wanted in the morning and could write and read when it suited me. And when one does what one wants, you feel good. At the time, I called it holiness and peace of mind. Now I have a boy who screams all night. When I should be working on the sermon, Margareta comes to me with a broken shuttle. And when I finally get the train of thought back, the threads in the loom are tangled on her. And before we get them in order, it is a new mess in my poor head. After doing that dance for a year, you are under no delusion of becoming a saint. For a man knows ever more about grace than he did before. A man learns to live from pure mercy. And so he learns to be thankful that he can serve his neighbor amid all this everyday life instead of serving himself with a bunch of spiritual fabrications that God has never asked for and that don't serve anyone on earth. Here you have that 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 thesis of Luther, that that a Christian is perfectly free, subject to no one, and a dutiful servant, subject to everyone. In, in that Anders is saying, or Peter is now saying, listen, before, you know, I thought I had to go to church and do all of this other stuff in order to become holy. Now I realize I am holy only by the mercy of God, only by the grace of God. 
And that allows me not to try to earn my own righteousness or my own sanctification, but I can now just serve my neighbor. In this case, his wife. And, and in this case, uh, marriage then takes the place of, of the monastery, um, which in the history of the church, especially in the Middle Ages, a lot of times when people got sick of being married, they just kind of, you know, blew it all off and went into the monastery. Uh, and and uh, Peter's saying perhaps it should be the other way around. Um, not sure how much time we have here, but uh, we're, uh, we get this conversation now between, between Peter and, uh, between Peter and Martin later on. Again, talking about uh, worship and, and what needs to go on. Now, Peter, we have to realize he's become a, an ultra Protestant. Uh, he sees, uh, he doesn't like the liturgy. He doesn't think that the liturgy has any place. He thinks that the uh, robes and all of that need to go. Calm, calm. We have enough ceremonies, but we not believe that they are necessary for salvation. Certainly we have our old customs if they are not in conflict with God's word. One has to have some type of custom. In such things, God has left us free. But we never say that any works of any type are conditions for salvation. It is the Pope and you, Swarmerai, that say so. In essence, you are of the same metal. The Pope says, shave your head and fast on Wednesday and Friday and pray the whole Psalter every week. And then you will be holy and pious. And you say, comb your hair flat and wear gray clothing, and pray with your own words, and you will be holy and pleasing to God. But we say the gospel, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. It is the difference between faith and grace, and faith and works, righteousness. Of course, and so you are so justified by faith, that you can do contrary to God's command? Who has given you permission to make images of God? Peter answers, God himself has done that when he let his son become a man. No one shall try to make an image of the invisible God, but the Son of Man, so that our eyes would be able to see God and his salvation. By the way, Christ is the end of the law, both in questions of idolatry and Sabbath and all rest. And by the way, how are you, holy Lord? Do you keep all the statutes of the elders? Do you live according to the law? Do you keep the Sabbath on Saturday? No, answered the Scrivener, astonished. I can believe that. You still retain some Christian freedom. I just love that that, that exchange there between Peter and uh, Martin. In, in that uh, you see this, this the, the Schwarmerei, the, 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 the Pentecostals of the age, and, and the Catholics, have this in common. They think you can earn righteousness. So Peter just turns it all on its head. And then he says, oh, by the way, you worship on Sunday? Yeah, well, you know, the only way you can do that is with Christian freedom. Um, I, I could spend a whole, a whole lot of time on that topic alone. But I want to get to, finally, um, the last little quote that I have from this book that I want to read. And uh, this one ties in with the, the Bible verse that we started out with. Want to be pious? I'll tell you one thing, Martin. It is the greatest sin there is to want to be pious. So long as a man wants to be pious and holy, he thinks only about himself. He is captivated by his own notability. He wants to be someone even before God. If he does something good for his neighbor, he does it only for his own sake, because he heard that that is what a saint should look like. The whole time he looks out for himself, and the good he does, he gathers it all up together and amasses it like a dragon with his worthless gold in order to have something to praise himself for before the throne of God. This is why God has to make every self-sanctified fool into a truly great sinner in order to overcome them. 
Sometimes he lets them fall into coarse sin. Others he plagues with their sinful depravity until they despair and recognize that they really deserve eternal condemnation. So long as we watch ourselves and want to be holy, we are nothing but coarse sinners. Even if we see a halo in the mirror, the worst is that people have such an unbelievable desire to look at themselves. They are normally not cracked before they see that the mask of sin creeps in everywhere and that they are more loathsome to watch than a decaying dog's corpse on the side of the road. Then they might finally desire to see something different. And then the Holy Spirit will be able to turn their eyes to Christ in earnest. Then they notice that the Savior alone in all the earth can atone for such abominable sinners. Then they think that Christ is the loveliest person there is to look upon. And he who sees him and believes him, he at that moment receives the wonderful gift that only God can give. To be able to see his neighbor and discover him just when he needs help. He no longer thinks about doing good deeds, but he does good. He no longer wants to be holy, but he has the Holy Spirit, and therefore he serves. He does not see the holy saint before him as a model for how he ought to be, but he only sees the neighbor who suffers need and goes to him to serve him. So, here we see how Bo Geertz incorporates the, this theme of uh, a freedom of a Christian, um, which is a freedom not to be a crass sinner, but a freedom to finally look away from some yourself to get rid of your own selfishness and to look at your neighbor. Because you don't have to do anything to be holy. You are holy. And we see that, that uh, here... Uh, this is why God condemns all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on us all. And in that mercy, we would find freedom. Peace of God be with you all. Amen.